Um, so, um, Mohamed, um, you organized, the two of you actually organized a conference, um, a series of workshops um, that lasted three days at AUP, um, where you welcomed the interaction of art history students and computer scientists um, on artificial intelligence and swarm intelligence in particular. And um, what I'd like to, to, to know about you know, in artificial intelligence and how it relates to, um, how it relates to um, physiology and um, social behavior um, is, um, what's the, um, is, is there a recipe, in other words, for artificial intelligence? And if there is a recipe, is swarm intelligence one of the recipes, one of the way of, of spurring, spurring intelligence in machines? Um, and um, what is creativity? So could you, could you tell us a little bit more about, about the workshop and why you welcome the interaction between art history students and computer scientists and and um, I think well m probably if I go back it's because of the multidisciplinary nature of, of our work I've been always interested in multidisciplinary work different different fields and the same the same for my colleague so we somehow found this uh, we, we somehow find this work as multidisciplinary in a way that would get us to a, to a point where we would appreciate having many inputs from different fields, from science, from medicine, from physiology, as well as art. And because swarm intelligence is, a, is an emerging intelligence, the intelligence which is distributed, it's not, it doesn't belong to one entity, there is no leader in the, in the swarms. They lead one another and they still have uh, they still have a structure in the way they function, so they all find the solution all together. So in a sense, it gave us the flexibility to start with swarm intelligence as the, as the base and use some other inputs from, from, from other fields, from other disciplines to come up with this, uh, with this work. And mainly, the, the visualization of the swarms kind of led us to this field because it, in the beginning it's a totally scientific work, it's core science, but when you try to visualize the behavior of the swarms, when you see the, when you see the, the structure that they have, when you see the beauty of the movement, you inevitably want to look at it from the, the art perspective, your emotion somehow gets involved because of this natural beauty that emerges in the behavior of the swarm. And yeah, so when when we started the discussion, we 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 realized that there's a, there's a good potential of taking this one further one further uh, step ahead, and that's where. Um, yeah, how did you two come together? In how what was the uh, the link? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, it was um, I, I, I don't it, 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 we 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 knew each other before before we went to university, so. We, k we kept the link and we were always discussing different things and um, obviously I was, I was thinking if we can use the artificial intelligence for medical applications, especially like medical imaging. But um, after a series of discussion, it, because as he mentioned, the, the, the nature of, the, of swarm intelligence and the nature of physiology is very core science and it is very difficult um, to convince people of the applicability of the interdisciplinary of the of emerging intellig artificial intelligence with medicine, and I think, um, as he mentioned, we we find the middle ground is that in in, in creating a, a visual art or a, a visualization, which is which is the result of the combination of the physiology and the artificial intelligence, we can we can provide a very good example that this works, and uh, this was the whole purpose. So that we and and the reason we use physiology in addition to the swarm intelligence is because um, both, b b both swarm intelligence and physiology are very stable in terms of like b b because they, they, they have gone through a very long process of evolution and they have created this, this stable intelligent system which can be, which can be then applied to, to an art. It provides a very good firm platform right. for the... So is, is the swarm a physiological process? I think I think in it, a way, in, in a way it, it, it is, but uh, it, 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 like it is it is more of a more of a metaphor. But the metaphor is, is based on based on a, based on something which is present in nature. 
Yeah, and, and probably we don't want to confine where physiology can step in because there might be other possibilities. But in this particular world, the way that physiology fit in is through the fact that each member of the swarm acts as a as a as a biological as a biological or physiological mechanism. So each one of these swarms, each one of these members can be considered as a cell. So the behavior of the cells in muscle would affect the behavior of the swarm, the way they function on the canvas in this particular world. There right. can be different variations in the way in the way that they, they are used. But at the same time that you are kind of moving <coughs> ahead with the visualization, we have in mind the scientific bit as well. How can we use this visualization to enhance the current swarm intelligence algorithm for a specific set of problems, obviously? Right, see, uh, very interesting. You, you mentioned uh, just um, earlier on, you mentioned that uh, there is no leader in the swarm, right? That they're all individual agents, uh, not necessarily very intelligent individually, uh, but when brought together, their intelligence um, emerges or manifests. Um, so if there is no leader, how does the swarm operate? Um, um, is it through interaction, the individual agents interact? And what's the process? Is it like I res you know, receive information, a, you receive information, you interpret information, and then resend information through to the rest of the pack, or the rest of the swarm, and then there is that process going on continually? What's, what's yeah, the well secret of the intelligence of, this, of the swarm? <laughs> well, the secret, there are many secrets, not just one, depending on which swarm community we are looking at. If we look at the community of the ants, there are different species of the ants, and they function in a different way. So the information exchange in one type of ant is different from the other type. And if you look at the birds, the way that the birds are functioning are different. If you look at the, if you look at the bacterial growth, if you look at the animal herding, they all have different structure. But what they have in common is the lack of a leader or the lack of an explicit leader. They change this, this role of the leadership among, among, among themselves. So they somehow, they're just friends in a way, if we, we can use the, if you can use this term. But what makes the, that's why in fact in this workshop we didn't stick to one swarm intelligence algorithms. Because as you say, what is the secret? There are many. So what we try to do is to introduce some elements of one particular type of social animals and use another one so that it would give a, a rather uh, broader idea on, on how these swarms interact and how they exchange information. But there are one main thing, for example, in one of these algorithms that might, that might give you a, that's a small idea. If, if we consider a flock of birds moving in the sky, the simple rules that they follow is that they should not hit one another, they should, they should match their speed, so one shouldn't go faster than the other, so they should match their speed as, as they fly, and also they should, keep the, they, should, they should stick to the flock, they shouldn't go far away from the flock. So that's how they move in such beautiful <coughs> manner in the sky without being completely uh, diverse. Right. And so when it comes to physiology, this notion of survival, of having the, the swarm, the purpose of the swarm mm. is that when brought together, they, they are stronger. Yes. So they can cope with the environment mm -hmm. um, as we, they're in, in, you know, spread out. And um, so there's that, is there that notion of, of, um, of uh, survival or um, um, of optimizing, optimizing uh, um, individual resources through the collective? Mm. What is what is so interesting about the application of the swarm is that we we we're not trying to imitate we we're not trying to copy nature we're trying to imitate create the metaphor it's it's, it's almost like we're copying a metaphor and we 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 applying this into creating this this visualization this art so maybe in reality in nature it is about survival but in the application that we used it it was for optimizing the the initial sketchy art. That, that, that someone may make in the canvas. I'll, I'll be very careful about using the word art because, like for instance, if you, if you look at the work that we've done, is that there is, there is a very simple, primitive sketch. And then when the swarm, aided by physiology, whether it is the muscle cells, whether it is the cartilage cells, this, this would enhance the, the, the sketch. It would give it 
maybe it would make it more, more beautiful, maybe not. <laughs> so th this way, it's, it's all about optimizing the, the initial sketch. That, that's interesting, mm. really interesting. So the notion of beauty, the beauty mm. of the swan, so how they, you know, how they, 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 they come together. Mm. Uh, you were mentioning speed that they don't um, exceed each other's speed, they keep you know, going at the same, same pace. Uh, so they were given parameters, and those initial parameters could be perhaps also the parameters that make them collaborate or um, converge. Um, so they operate within the, the given set of of variables or of parameters. Um, but in more general terms, you you talk about creativity um, because the question you raise is creative or not. Birds and ants draw with muscles. Um, and so what is creativity and um, is there a connection with swarm intelligence and physiology and what's what's <laughs> I think I think there's there's one very important thing here and that that issue is that we are not very much bothered about the, the aesthetic side of the world in the same way that probably bees are not I'm not sure if bees are careful when they are building the beehive to make it beautiful or to have a structure or if they are building this uh, these uh, hives because of their functionality so there's so there's a question should we stick to the functionality of the work or should we just stick to the to the visual appearance so up to this point we haven't been trying to make the work we haven't been trying to enhance let's say the the artistic side of the work but this is the functionality of the of the work that is resulting in this in this work on right. the on the canvas so as i said we don't know in the social animals are they do they really care to fly beautifully do they really care to is it is it their main concern or it's it's the way that they over the course of the time over the course of the evolution mm. over the right. course of the progress so there is an aesthetic to, there is an aesthetic of functionality in other words and perhaps it's our perception after session, we see that as beautiful, but it's not necessarily the case. It's just that it's and, and even the birds when they fly when they fly in the sky. Do you consider it beautiful? Does everybody consider it beautiful? Is it a is it a universal answer that what they see is a is a beautiful thing? So it's a it's 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 a very complicated um, situation. I would say there is no definitive answer in terms of whether it is art, whether it is beautiful. Uh, I think. Uh, We'll, we'll leave it to the to the viewers of the of the work to say whether it is. Yes, yeah. because also this we, we don't claim that uh, it, it is art because that's a. Yeah, another. we don't claim it's art and we don't claim that it's a creative work because the paper that you are referring to was uh, presented in a computing and philosophy symposium by AISP, and there th among the audience there were philosophers and there were scientists and there were broad range of views. With the, with the word presented. Some people would say, this work is not creative at all. And some people would say, I can see the element <laughs> of the creativity. <laughs> so the, in the same way that we have the creativity of the nature, now we have the, we have yes. the rain. The rain is creativity. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the creativity of, of, um, of, of the swarm, um, if there is to be one, it could be perhaps efficiency, um, the notion of optimizing individual skills um, through interaction. And then the swarmers are behaving like an individual in the end, like, like, a, like a one and single agent. One, one unit, yeah. One unit. Um, could that help machines think better or think and create? It, it does in a way, that's why, that's why there are many researchers in, in AI and in swarm intelligence who are, who are not bothered about the artistic side at all. In the same way that, as I said, maybe we shouldn't be too bothered. This is just the result on the side along the way. If someone takes it from this, from this aspect, maybe they can enhance the, the artistic side. But there are many researchers in the field who are, who are thinking about the, the functionality of the, in terms of the behavior of the machine. Is it good to have the knowledge distributed? Would it help the, the information processing? Or is it good to have one headquarters 
and allow all the processes to be happening there. Right. So like one leader? Is it, yeah, is it better to have one leader or is it better, better to have all members of the society to have an input in what, in what they are saying? So in a way, distributed, sense, uh, distributed processing or distributed compute, computational approach for multi-population or multi-agent systems are in a way mm. are in a way less vulnerable because if a member of the society is hit the others, the others are not hit and according to one of the I was attending one of uh, one of Armand's lecture and he was referring to the same thing about the physiology like in the in the cells mm -hmm. we have cells they are affected that that won't affect the whole structure of the cell the whole structure because they work as a unit there is I mean, no leader the, the, and, and like it, it is very complicated this when, when we talk about leader and, and the body obviously like the, 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 but but if we speak specifically about a certain tissue then then we can think about them as be, as being divided into units for instance yesterday we were talking about the muscle uh, the muscle and the nerves like every nerve creates a unit a motor unit with with a number of muscle fibers so for instance if you, if you have one of this nerve severed, this motor unit is going to be damaged, whereas the other motor units in the same muscle will be functioning, despite the fact that there is this one motor unit being, being destroyed. So it's, a, it, it's, it's useful in a sense that not the whole system is going to be shut Affected. down, right. it's, and, and it's only going to be this one unit out of the whole being affected. Again, that sort of has to do with survival, having... Survival, well, yes. And um, um because I, I think I think it, it is always important to remember as a body as a, as a as a survival machine for 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 the for the genes that we carry, and these genes they have throughout the years they have found clever ways to to ma to maintain themselves throughout the harsh environment of the of the earth. So, for instance, we look at the muscle cells; they act in a, in, in a certain way. The cartilage cells. They act in a certain way. All of this to enable them to be, to be able to survive the harsh and the complicated environment that they live in. Right, and when you say they act in a certain way, is it because they're coded in a certain way? Yes, and the code lies in the gene. Right. And, and in a way, all this, all these cells, I, l I like to imagine that they are, they are the, these survival machines that they're trying to protect the code. So in a way, me and you, we are, we are code protectors. And, 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 and our job is to pass on the code to the next generation and the next generation act as a, as a survival machine and so on and so forth. Fascinating. <laughs> um, and is there, is, is there an ongoing process of improvement, nevertheless? Or uh, that, that would be the, perhaps the evolutionary process of mm -hmm. um, biological uh, organisms and so on and so forth. But um, so there is a given code and the cells act on that code, but then if perhaps external circumstances change over the years, then they learn to incorporate those changing um, sets of information or data or whatever, and mm -hmm. then they act accordingly. So there's a notion of adaptation, adjustment. Yes, and um, what is, obviously the, the, way the, the, the way the genes they behave and the way they mutate and change their codes, is, it, it's as a result of this. Um, and what is so interesting, like in, in artificial intelligence, uh, there is a very famous algorithm, the genetic um, algorithm, which is based on the based on the different behaviors that the genes exhibit to, to, to survive and to be. But but sometimes the survival mechanism can lead to the demise of the of the of the cell. For instance, like in mutation, it can lead to your survival. And the reason that we are here today is because we had successful mutation. But I'm sure, like some primitive, primitive organisms, they, they they did have a mutation which went wrong, and they and they and they died. That's why the dinosaurs, really? they, because they couldn't, they were not able to, to to have the appropriate mutation, the appropriate uh, change in the code. They died, whereas we survived because right. we had the right mutation. And we don't know how it's going to be like if the if the environment changes vastly. Are we going to survive or are we going to die? So it doesn't always work. It doesn't. It doesn't always work. It doesn't always work. Th th that's why we. That's why, for instance, if you look at certain certain animals, they they, they create lots of off offsprings to enable the code to be passed on because so many of them they cannot survive. So the survival machine is a very complicated uh, 
a very complicated notion. It doesn't only rely on the genes, it also relies on, on, the, on the number of offsprings you can have and so on and so forth. But I think one interesting question to ask Mohammed is about the genetic algorithm and how the metaphor have been imitated uh, right from the notions of, of, the, of the science of genetics. Yeah, probably we had, we had, we had a very interesting discussion because when I was, when I was explaining how the genetic algorithm works from a, a computer science perspective, I said, okay, this is, it is similar. We have the concept of mutation. We have the concept of Cross, crossover. crossover. We have the concept of selection. What you guys are taking part of it because it's very complicated. We can't take all the, all the complicated mechanism, all the complicated physiological mechanism, and use it in programming when we, when we code the, the algorithm. So what we are taking is that we take, well, the previous uh, generations of computer scientists were taking part of this, uh, part of this uh, mechanism, something that could be implemented in real work so that it would be functional. But the actual genetic, the, the real genetic algorithm is far more complicated. That's why even in the, even in the codes that we have, there are different variations of the, of the whole, of the whole genetic algorithm because there is not one version. We don't know all the details of how the genes are working or functioning. But that's why when, when we, when we open the topic of the, of the cartilage, it's just a starting point. Maybe something comes up. Maybe, maybe it doesn't. It doesn't mutate in the right way, and the idea dies well, out in the same way. That so we, we've been trying different physiological systems to see how we can incorporate this into into two different. So, so we, for instance, what Mohammed does is that, that he merged two two swarm algorithms together, and then and then we add a physiological process into it, and we see how it does in terms of. The visual, the, the, the visual work that we create, that some people might call it art, some people might not call it art. And so that, that's a um, uh, drawing with muscles. Uh, uh, no, the muscles. The, the we we started with the cartilage, then right. we draw with the muscles, and and then we try to draw with the blood flow, and the and the blood blood pressure. Oh, draw with the blood flow. And the blood pressure, and. Uh, <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> and 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 we've been and and we will try and use different different physiological processes and you use and imitate di different features in this. Right, so you have any, any visual proof of this or a sort of manifestation of drawing with the blood flow and the blood pressure? Uh, are there any yes, examples? There is, hopefully it will, be, it will be published in a book chapter very soon. So it's in the process of editing and, and working on the final, on the final version. Hopefully in the next couple of months it will be, it will be available <laughs> to the wider audience. Excellent. So who, who draws? Does, um, does, does a human being draw using the, the, the program or the system? That's or a, that's or a does very the machine draw yeah. sort of um, mm. autonomously? Who, what's the, who is the artist? Yeah, well, in, in <laughs> now uh, this, this is a very interesting question. And then that would take us to who should be credited? For the artwork, <laughs> yeah. the swarm intelligence number one, the swarm intelligence number two, the person who's moving the mouse on the canvas, the blood flow, blood vessel, who should be credited? Because it's a, it's one of those debates that might not, that might not, probably okay. we are not able to give the answer on who's the owner. Or is it a collaborative artwork, perhaps? Probably. That's the easiest. That's the easiest way that we can put it now. It's a collaborative work, but maybe one of them plays a bigger role. So if they if they had a voice, probably they would they would they would object to the fact that we called it a collaborative uh, work. <laughs> so uh, this is like like some kind of an engine, right? That that you can use then to paint or to c or to create or. But you mentioned drawing, but what about music? Could you could you use this for music? Um, could you compose an, uh, a symphony or um, if not a symphony? At least, um, you know, a sonata or uh, something simple. Mm. Probably, it won't be. It won't be as if I'm if I talk from my classical kind of uh, interest in classical music. It won't be as beautiful as Bach or Mozart. <laughs> <laughs> but this is something that many people call noise, right? And many people enjoy this noise, huh. this noise music. Because they, because these noise, in the same way that some people are, some people work better with images. They understand the behavior of something when they look at the images. Some people function better with, uh, with this noise, with these voices, with these sounds that are coming out. So they try to imagine how 
the, how the it's just hearing noises yes. <laughs> <coming> <laughs> illustrating <laughs> the whole world so some people function better by by hearing these noises to see how the swarms are functioning like when they are closer they, they exhibit a different kind of voice when they are scattered imagine that you, that you have a, a school of fish in the ocean if if a shark attacks the school of fish they scatter so probably that could that could correspond to a different kind of uh, noise noise right in a way and that could signal something the shark is attacking yes yes so so it is possible to 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 play around and put it in different discipline probably that's why that's why it has this flexibility that you decide whether you work on the visualization on the, the musical or the noisy part or the Right, because each formation sort of has its own noise, in a way, its own sound signature. Yeah. When they are together, they make a certain noise. If they spread out, then they make a different noise. Uh, because the the program that um, is on uh, your website, uh, arcofbeing uh, dot com, um, which is really a uh, funky program. It's really um, entertaining to use and start drawing mm. um, with uh, swarm intelligence. It makes noises. It makes certain noises according to how tightly um, fitted uh, the, the, the dots are or if they are spread out they make different noises so how how is that done who, who sort of designed that well I think it was it was a very very simple very simple program there was I we just wanted to make it more let's say interactive for the multimedia for the process, yeah, yeah. and interactive mm -hmm. but the idea of multimedia is that we had the visualization so we thought okay maybe we can add this noise idea to it so so in that in that algorithm, which is on the website, it's very simple, nothing, nothing super special. But when the swarms are closer, they exhibit, they, they, they give a different, a different noise. When they are scattered, they're different. And depending on, on how they move, also they create different, different noise. So if someone makes a drawing or if someone makes a sketch and the swarms are following the sketch in order to be able to give the interpretation of the original sketch, then a noise would come along. So after after a while, you would you would be able to match when a noise would come by the with the speed of the of your drawing, with the if your drawing is concentrated, what what would be the result? So it's a very it's a very simple work. There's nothing complicated about it at this stage. What I find um, a truly innovative um, um, and um, Captivating is the fact that generally in a, in, in, in a work of art, you have the artist as the individual agent, imagining, creating, being inspired. Um, so um, that's an individual artwork, which means an individual perception of reality, his reality. Whereas with collective intelligence, form intelligence, it's the multiplicity of the inputs uh, of um, the uh, facets of reality. So you have multiple facets of reality and they all they're sort of integrated right. uh, into one understanding, uh, unitary understanding or collective understanding. Um, so with the artwork c um, created, artwork or um, visualization or audio manifestation, um, it's sort of a compound of different um, understandings of reality, different facets of reality, different points of view, and they're all brought together in, into one. And that's what I found truly interesting with drawing, because you, you draw it's not just one straight line from one dot to another. It's multiple dots, and it's like multiple views of that one dot that you're trying to, to draw. That's what... Yeah, yeah, probably, and, and, and that's why what, when we, in the first work, where we just had the swarms, the, the, the everybody can, can move the, the mouse, and then the swarms would give their own interpretation by the original sketch, or they get, let's say, inspired by the original sketch, which is made by a human being, or randomly. But when we add this physiological mechanism to it, then still it's another interpretation of the original work. So it's different interpretation. One, one work is being interpreted by the, by the muscle, the other one is being interpreted by the, by the cartilage. cartilage, the other one is with the blood flow. So it's different inter interpretation of, of probably the same thing. All into one. All into one. So if, you, so if you look so at it's like parallel. Yeah, so it's like complementary or. Yeah, it's like a language. You might have one word and it's being translated in different languages, but if they have the same meaning. That's why that's if you look at all these canvases, they have the same structure. Right. 
right. but, but different interpretations. So and you, you haven't tried anything with music so far? No, no, we haven't. Yet. So that would make for an interesting uh, experiment. <laughs> it would, certainly, <laughs> yes. Uh, well, uh, gentlemen, thank you uh, so much uh, for granting us this um, uh, fascinating interview. Uh, it certainly is a fascinating topic, and I uh, hope you enjoyed your stay in Paris. And we hope to see you uh, soon on, again on uh, Quartz TV. We'll definitely follow your uh, progress and your research. Okay, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you.